No gun has ever been successful did it the first try. Look, Bill Gates, all these guys, right? They, they kept stabbing at the beast until they finally slayed it. You know, sometimes they have to stab it from a different angle, but they got it done. Nothing is easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And if everybody was, if it was that easy, everybody would be in the 1% club, right? There wouldn't actually be no 1% club. It'd be a 100% club, <laughs> right? right? So um, It'd be the other way around. <laughs> yeah, you want to be a one percenter, you got to do the work. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics. Josh making bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super excited and honored for today's guest. We have broken the code on human performance. You have it in you to expand your capabilities and reach far beyond what anyone thought was your maximum capability, not even you. What's stopping you? Excuses sound best to the person that is making them up. Take responsibility to make your life happen. Do not let your circumstances define you. Tier One Performance Coaching is the only performance coaching company in the country that incorporates Special Operations Forces Psychosoma training into their coaching sessions. This proprietary approach to optimal performance is science and experience based in what separates us from the rest of the performance coaches out there. This is a completely holistic approach to optimal performance. If you don't want to sacrifice for what you want, what you want will become a sacrifice. Be worthy of greatness. Be in control of your own destiny. You hold the pen to your future. Write your own story. Don't be the person that says, why me? Be the person that says, try me. You will never be out of the fight. And when you get knocked down, you will get back up. Nobody and nothing will stop you ever. You will be a force to be reckoned with. This is your chance. This is your moment. This is your time. And this is your opportunity. We won't tell you why. We will show you how. Dale has given over 37 years of service to the United States combating U.S. enemies abroad. He has served in every campaign from Grenada to the present conflicts in the United States. He is involved as a frontline combatant directly engaging the enemy, either as a paratrooper, Green Beret, Delta Force Operator, OGA Paramilitary Operative, and Freelance Soldier. He has been decorated twice for valor in combat and is also the famed breacher that explosively breached the Modelo Prison in Panama during the 1989 U.S. invasions and rescue of Kurt Muse. You can read more about his life and his combat experiences in his new book, American Badass. As a successful businessman entrepreneur, Dale has started up, operated, and sold two of three security companies since 2001 to the present. The third company is still operational in Bali, Indonesia, where he resides half of the year and provides explosive detector and patrol canines for all of the Marriott Resort hotels and other local venues. The first company he started in 2001 
was global security consultants that serviced the entire nuclear energy sector in the United States until 2004, where his company was bought by G4S. In 2016, he incorporated Risk Control Institute, a security consulting company that was purchased by Intrepid Global Security Services in 2011, as well as Dale has a huge, massive resume that we're going to dive into here in the interview today. So I'm excited to welcome Dale Comstock to Making Bank. David, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. If I sound a little raspy. I got a, I had a chest cold about 10 days ago that uh, ah. I've been fighting it. I'm okay, but it's just getting all that junk. Kind of, yeah. So, no, <laughs> no worries. It just makes you sound gruff. Yeah. So if I'm clearing my throat, excuse me. Oh, <laughs> uh, good, man. Uh, so we kind of talk, touch base a little bit on your background. So uh, tell, tell me a little bit about it. And we were talking off air and stuff. Um, you said you got started as martial art in martial arts when you were 13 and everything. What kind of drove you down that path and that kind of got you on that road to where you are today? Yeah. So, so I actually started in Germany. My father was in the army and, uh, you know, I grew up most of my uh, childhood into my teenage years in Germany. And, uh, there was a, um, a military guy that ran a uh, dojo after work, you know, and, uh, he, he was teaching a uh, Shotokan karate and that's how it kind of got started. So I was, a, I was the wimpy kid, you know, and I was a little guy always getting in fights and stuff. And, um, and so my dad thought it was a good idea to send me to martial arts training. And, uh, and since then, you know, it's become a big part of my life. Um, I'm 58 now and all my life I've either, I've, I've studied martial arts. I've got a first degree black belt in American Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I've got two six degree black belts in American combat karate. Also, uh, it's what's called extension fighting. Uh, I was a professional boxer. I was a professional MMA fighter. I was fighting MMA before MMA was actually popular. And, uh, so um, I've run a lot, a lot of combative courses and, and I've got products out there uh, on a lot of my trainings and things like that. I've written a lot of books on it. So it's just something I enjoy doing. I'm not a bully, uh, but it's because I was bullied. I became mm -hmm. an expert in the craft of uh, martial arts. So, you know, and, and my, you know, my, my, my kids indulge in it as well. My oldest son, he started uh, when he was four years old um, with me, in fact, and he awesome. earned his first degree black belt by the time he was seven. Um, his sister has a second degree brown belt. She gave that up for cheerleading. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? You know, and she, I want to be a cheerleader. I said, like, come on, you know? And so anyway, she did. And it was fine. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, so I've got a, a pretty extensive martial arts background, but it's not uh, what defines me. It's just part of my character, my DNA, you know? And I think it was always there. Even, even though I didn't take, you know, before I took martial arts, I was always a scrapper. I had to be out of necessity, you know? And, right. uh, and I had a lot of had a lot of fights as a kid just because I was the quiet kid, the runt, and uh, I was the easy target. So, fortunately, I had parents that both were very, um, I don't want to say aggressive, but they were aggressive, you know. And they basically didn't like the idea of me getting beat up. And I and I had an ultimatum, either fight and win or come home and get my butt beat by my parents. So, you know, I was up no alternative <laughs> but to go out and, uh, and handle business. So, that's kind of how I got started in martial arts. And uh, it's been a great journey. And it's done a lot for my confidence, my self-esteem. And, uh, of course, I made a lot of money doing it as well. And it's been a win all the way around. No, that's great. I mean, I think martial arts are super important, um, you know, with the discipline and different things that they bring you. And like you said, it's not to be a bully. It's, you know, it's to give you, you know, uh, self-confidence, that opportunity, if something did come up, you, to be able to protect yourself, your family, that's right. and everything else as well. So kind of take us through that little bit of that journey, um, martial arts growing up and everything. Obviously you've continued on and you mentioned that you, you've utilized this to start businesses and trainings and different things like that, uh, to help other people as, as, as well. Um, what kind of took you down the road? Your dad, you said well, your dad was in the military. Is that kind of why then you enrolled in the military or? Kinda... Yeah. So my father was in the army. Uh, he spent 20 years in service. Actually he went okay. in, uh, when he was 17, uh, Vietnam era. And, uh, and I grew up in the culture, the military culture, as a result. I uh, spent a good portion of my childhood in Germany, uh, lived in a lot of military bases around the United States. And, and that's how I grew up. It's a, you know, the military culture is very different from the mm. civilian culture out there. And, uh, you know, I always tell people that, you know, when you, when you live on an American concern or American base, and at five o'clock, you know, when, uh, 
you know, the, the, the bugle plays and we treat the flag, you know, everybody stops, gets out of their cars, they salute the flag and all the civilians, the kids would salute the, you know, put their heart, their arm over their, their hand over their heart. You know, that was the kind of lifestyle that I grew up in, very patriotic. And uh, so when my father retired, of all things, he got a job in Fremont, California, in the Bay Area. <laughs> and so we moved up there and I went to school and I felt like a fish out of water. Now, like a completely different culture. I had a hard time adjusting, making friends with the kids. It sounds kind of weird, um, but, it, you know, it was a fact. And I was very uncomfortable. And all I could do was think about getting back into service. So actually, I did the same thing he did. Um, I went down to, to the recruiter's office at age 17 and enlisted on the delayed entry program. As soon as I graduated high school, I was off into the military. So I did 20 years in. Um, I spent four years in 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper infantryman, long range scout. I spent uh, five years in Special Forces as a Green Beret, light and heavy weapons expert. And I spent 10 years in the United States Army's Delta Force Counterterrorist Unit as an assaulter, uh, breacher, and, uh, and other things. So that was my, my military career. And then, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that my son is also a Green Beret. He's followed my footsteps, Green Beret Ranger. Um, he's up in Fort Campbell, to Kentucky right now. My sister joined the Navy. Her, you know, her husband was in the Navy. I go on all my, my whole family is a military oriented family. And uh, we're very proud of that. And so um, that led to my retirement. And then I got recruited by OGA, um, other government agency, which is called, called that. Some people call it Office of Government Affairs, call it whatever you want. It's the alphabet <laughs> company. Um, and I won't right. actually you spell it out for you. Uh, but anyways, I've worked for them for nine and a half years as a paramilitary operative. And concurrently, while I was doing that, I started my first company called Global Security Consultants which got me into the nuclear security sector. Um, and my job was to service all the uh, nuclear power plants in the United States, which at the time there were 64 uh, facilities, 117 reactors, and I served approximately 42 of those. Um, 2004, WAC, at, the four, at the time G4S, Wack and Hut, they saw me as a competitor. So the best way to get rid of a competitor is buy them out. And so that's what ended up happening. Um, sold the company to them. I reinstituted uh, Risk Control Institute, which was a virtual company. And uh, again, I was managed to secure some more contracts in, in the nuclear industry. And in 2011, another company saw that and thought, hey, wh why don't we buy your company from you? And so they did. And uh, so along this path, along this journey, I ended up doing many other things. I ended up, like I said earlier, I've worked for OGA. And then uh, I got out of that. I got discovered by Discovery Channel, which is kind of ironic, right? So um, right. I, I ended up on a TV show called One Man Army. And uh, I guess NBC liked what they saw because they contacted me. I ended up on uh, Stars and Stripes with Terry Crews uh, nice. on NBC. And uh, and then from there, you know, it just started snowballing. I had a management team around me and uh, out of Dallas. And I became the poster boy for this their production company. Started, ended up doing more TV shows, things like that, kind of networking in the, in the business. And then I uh, woke up one day, realized that uh, Hollywood's not for me. It's a bunch of, everybody's faking the funk there, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> and and, 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 and none of that, a lot of the people there just got bad attitudes and, uh, you know, and uh, just full of shit, basically. So I, um, I ended up going to Hong Kong. Make a long story short, I ended up in Hong Kong running a security detail for a multi-billionaire investment banker. Um, and then that's where I met my current wife, who's Indonesian. Uh, she went back to Indonesia. I went back to the U.S. And then I finally followed her back to Indonesia from the U.S., liked what I saw and thought, yeah, hey, I see some business opportunities there. And uh, I ended up starting a company called, uh, well, it, originally it was called Strategic Outcomes Asia. And then... Uh, we moved the business to uh, Bali, Indonesia, where we reside now. That was eight years ago okay. uh, when we started. But we've been in Bali for four years, and uh, we have Strategic Outcomes Indonesia. So as you mentioned earlier in the introduction, uh, what we do is provide security and basically explosive narcotics and patrol attack dogs for Marriott properties and the local venues in the area. So um, canines are us. That's what we do over there. And uh, we were quite successful until COVID hit. And, uh, you know, that whole thing, you know, now, I won't tell you my opinion of it, but anyways, it completely wrecked my business in 90 days. I, um, I, I think we're both on the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah, i tell you what, i tell you what, it's just a scam and a half, and yeah. uh, they have literally destroyed lives with this crap. And uh, unfortunately, I lost a lot of employees, and their families lost a payroll, and I, I had, at one point, I had 45 canines. Um, if you price out a canine for that type of work, 
you're looking at a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar canine. You know, I went from forty five. I've got less than uh, I think down to seven now. Um, so I yeah took a huge hit, lost the dogs. They stopped working. You know, they sit around idle. You know, mm. trying to take care of them and all that. It just uh, just became a rat race for me. So it took a huge financial hit. Um, but I have. Uh, I've started actually several other businesses, uh, startups. I started one here in Florida not too long ago called Strategic Outcomes Florida, right? I, I like that term. So yeah, it, it you, works kinda, here. you had that same pro, uh, naming you stick Yeah, with. you know, exactly. So it, it's been working for me. So I did that here. And I've actually got some other businesses I do. I do a lot of performance coaching. Tier 1 Performance Coaching um, is my company along with Joe Tedai from uh, Discovery Channel. Okay. Dual Survival. He's my business partner in that. And so is my oldest daughter. So I've kind of... Uh, I'm kind of a journeyman. I do a lot of different things. I'm involved in a lot of different projects and things like that. And, uh, but I actually live the, I live a life fulfilled and I live, I really live the dream. I mean, Christ, I'm calling right now from Panama City Beach, Florida for my other home. I have a home in Bali. And uh, how cool is that? You know, I mean, That's I, live awesome. in, I live in Bali, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I it was cool because a good friend of mine always does. Uh, he or up until COVID, he was doing mastermind retreats in Bali. He's like, oh. dude, you got to come over here. You got to come over here. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we're gonna get there. And then like the year I plan is like when all the COVID stuff hit. I'm like, ah, yeah. you're kidding me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's terrible. And you know, you're right. There's a lot of lost opportunities because of this this COVID. Um, but um, you know, there's lost opportunities, but there's other opportunities as well. For so sure. I'll give you an example, you know, since we're kind of talking a little bit about entrepreneurship and things like that. So when COVID first struck, um, I came back to the U.S. in March because um, I actually had three contracts over the span of three weeks that I was going to uh, fulfill. They're basically law enforcement training and some other things that I do on the side. And uh, all three of those got canceled as soon as I showed up because of the COVID and and then next thing I know, there were travel restrictions in place. So I couldn't go back to Bali. So my wife and, and everybody's over there. I'm over here and uh, I'm sitting on my can thinking, well, okay, I can't do anything. And everybody's losing their jobs. Millions of people are losing their jobs. And, you know, and uh, the fear factor set in for everybody but me. Mm, so right. here's what I kind of, here's where I kind of went with this. Um, so I have a background in coaching. I was actually doing a lot of personal coaching. I've been doing that now for about almost five years. Um, my, my daughter actually turned me on to that, and I've been very successful at it. And I decided, well, why don't I ratchet it up with my daughter and with Joe Teddy? And so we started Tier 1 Performance Coaching. And uh, we're sitting in basically where I'm sitting at right now. I'm making money, like big money, you know, coaching right. people. And actually, the funny part about it is um, I'm coaching people that were really scared. And the reason they were really scared is because most people, they invest all their money and their energy into an education. They become very singular in their uh, job skills, right? So they're good at one thing. That's all they know, right? So they're whatever, an accountant or whatever, right? And then all of a sudden, that job poof goes away because of right. COVID. And you go, okay, now what do I do? I don't have any other job skills and other sources of income. Sure. And uh one of the biggest mistakes I think people make, and I think uh, what's name Mike Rowe would probably agree with me on this. You have to have um, multiple streams of income and you should have multiple uh, job skills unrelated so that you can, you have a fallback plan. Right. So for me, it was easy. It's like coaching. I could do that all day right here from my desk. And we did, and we went right through this thing. No problem. So, you know, the moral of the story is for those that are out there listening it's one thing to invest your everything you have into one business. But remember, man, if that business goes under for whatever reason, maybe no fault of your own, uh, you better have some contingency plans. And uh, otherwise, you're going to be like the millions of people that were hoping for that $2,000 stimulus check. Really? Yeah. How far? I mean, how far does that take most people? That lasts probably most people a week, two weeks. You know, sure. that poof, it's gone, right? Yeah. Um, it's like a little, you know, come on, it was a bunch of crap. So anyways, you know, I've been doing that and uh, – and, and so that's kind of why I'm here. So in this March, I came back with my wife. In fact, we came back for three weeks again, right? Here we go. It was like karma. And uh, funny thing was I had an investor that's been following me on other podcasts invite me to come back and spend some time up in his property in Maryland, uh, did some networking, shooting guns and things like that. And uh, we're like, okay, cool. He's paying. We're flying and we're playing with guns and stuff. And we're going to, you know, network. And then we're going to come back. You can't beat that. Yeah, right. And then we go back to Bali. Well, that changed again, right? So here comes more travel restrictions again. Uh, more so on the other end in Bali, right? So okay. 
I mean, literally they had police and military on every street corner checking papers. This was Nazi Germany all over again. OK, wow. um, people restricted, especially if you were an expat, you know, basically before it got dark, you better be inside because if you weren't. They're going to shake you down. They got want money. You know, they're going to extort you. People were hurting for money and uh, it was just turned really bad. So my wife and I decided to stay here. We, we our kids and our my sister in law, she actually lives with us. She's taking care of the home and, and what dogs I have left. And we, and our, we actually still have a business that's running and operational, but uh, on a smaller scale. Sure. So we say, oh, we'll delay it a month. We'll delay it another month. We'll delay it. And now it's December. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and we're thinking uh, maybe January. And I'm like, no, January's a no-go. We got, we got stuff planned for that. So we're thinking maybe February. But eventually we got to go back. We actually have kids over there, right? So, yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, we're, you know, so anyways, it is what it is. But, you know, we've been flexible again, you know, speaking from uh, a business perspective. I was here. I was able to take advantage of my time here. I was, I've done all kinds of stuff. I've done construction work for my friend's construction company. He needed help. Ironically, nobody wants to work, right? And so, and yeah. he really needed he needed people to help him. He asked me, "Can you come and help?" I said, "Sure." He's paying. I'm I'm hammered, right? So <laughs> I did that for a while. And then I've been doing some uh, freelance security stuff. I've been doing a lot of work out in San Francisco. Uh, if anybody's been following the news out there, that is a total train wreck. Um, mm. And so they're literally bringing in outside security because it's just getting to be too dangerous. Even the cops don't want to cover down on a lot of the uh, on the stores and venues there. But uh, so I've been doing that. My wife's been, you know, doing some side hustle as well, you know, and uh, we're doing all right. So here I am, you know, talking to you, counting the days <laughs> when I go back to Bali and <laughs> I do nothing. <laughs> so, Hopefully so. Yeah. Well, you mentioned so you mentioned um, you, you kind of get spun off um, with uh, with Joe and your oldest daughter and everything. Is that the critical survival learning skills training? Yeah. So uh, yes, exactly. So what we've done is uh, so a little bit about my foundation first. I have what's called psychosoma engineering, and basically it's mind body engineering for optimal performance, right? So, okay. And and what I do, and actually my demographics, believe it or not, is between forty five and fifty five year old males mostly. However, I do have females. Uh, my second demographic is young men from the age of nineteen to twenty six. These are guys that are in the military or want to go into the military, particularly want to go into special operations. And then my third demographic is men between the ages of 33 to 37. These guys tend to be entrepreneurial. Um, you know, some had military experience. Others are out there just trying to build, build business. So um, what I focus on primarily, especially what I call the old man clan, the 45 and the 55 year old guys. Um, is, I think I guess I'm in that. I'm 48. So. Well, I'm 58. So, you know, I'm, I'm way, I'm way, I'm king of the old man clan. But, uh, but what I do is I teach people how to reinvent themselves, um, recapture, recover their lives, live the best life possible, which by the way, at 58, I'm, I'm living like a 20 year old kid. Um, you yeah. know, and so, you know, I show people how to do that. There's a mindset that goes with that. And it's not just positive thinking and all this other stuff that, you know, all these other coaches out there tout. It's actually science. Success mm. is based on science, literally on science. So if you understand the science behind it, you understand frequency, electromagnetic energy. You know, Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla will all tell you the same thing. If you understand how that works and you can channel that energy, um, you can be anything you want to be. So I teach people how to do that. I get into the metaphysical world. I get into a lot of other very abstract areas, but I kind of put it all together and uh, make it presentable and understandable for my clients so that they can uh, improve their lives. I've coached millionaires. I've coached, you name it, law enforcement, teachers, doctors, photographers, all walks of life, nurses, um, anybody that wants to change in their life and wants to be better. That's what I do. So what happened was Joe is, um, as you know, from dual survival. Right. He's also got, uh, you know, He's probably the only guy that has a resume close to mine. And, uh, but he's a, he's a hard charger. He's 55 years old. The guy's still running triathletes. He's just an amazing, uh, just amazing human being. And we decided to join forces with my daughter, who also teaches female entrepreneurs on internet and business, uh, internet uh, marketing and business techniques. And, uh, uh, and she just makes silly money doing that. But her focus is on feminism, on women. So we've kind of put all right. this together and we create tier one performance coaching. And so it's a, it's a good combination. Uh, my daughter does all the visual stuff, websites, because me and Joe are too dumb for that. <laughs> and, uh, but she's really good at it. So um, that's kind of what we do there in the, in the performance coaching uh, and in, in that sphere anyways. That's awesome. And so maybe just kind of taking a little bit from your performance coaching for a minute. 
what are maybe like the top three things that when you guys are working with people on, you're like, cool, this is what, here's, here's something we can show you that you can take and do right now to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So first of all, um, so I cover three areas primarily. Uh, I have a, you know, think of it as cogs in a wheel. Okay. Three sure. cogs in a wheel. They all have to be of equal length. Okay. For that wheel to roll properly. Um, if one cog is too short, you're going to get a hobble in it. And I actually have a fourth cog I add, and that's a business aspect. I have a lot of people that come to me that want to talk about business development, things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, but first of all, I focus on the body. Okay. Why nutrition diet. I miss, you know, miss, um, dispel a lot of myths that are out there. And I teach people how to live a healthier life physically because it's very imp- uh, important that uh, your your body's uh, in a uh, in a in homeostasis all the time. Everything's in equilibrium and it's functioning properly. Um, most people don't understand health or diet, nutrition. So I get that out of the way. In fact, most of the people that come to me are already overweight and they're like, "How do I get my girlish figure back?" Right. And so what I do is I put them on a diet fitness plan uh, over the course of the training, which is about eight weeks long. And start shaving weight off and getting them, whipping them back in, in the shape. In fact, I had one guy lose 44 pounds in 48 days on my program. And then the next area I go into is I go into the consciousness. Okay. Basically, you know, I change, par- challenge pe- people to challenge their own paradigms, change their ways of thinking. Right. So um, what's interesting is by the time you're 35 years old, okay, and this is all, this is not me making this stuff up. This is fact out there. By the time you're 35 years old, um, you've been programmed 95%. Of that programming, 95%, 50% of that information is bad information. It's false information. In fact, your experiences tend to be false also, right? And what I mean by that is if you and I share an experience and then we talk about it five years later and you tell the story, I go, wait a minute, that's not what actually happened. Your perspective is different, right? right. Maybe mine is right. And he's like, no, you're wrong. But that's what you're living off of is that bad perspective, right? Yeah. And so you're making bad decisions off of you know half false information and false experiences. Um, so I show, tell people, if you want to improve moving forward, you got to stop thinking about the past. Yes, you have to stop using the past ways of thinking experiences moving forward. Otherwise, the future will look like the past. Um, so we, we focus on challenging those paradigms and those ways of thinking. Also, you know, what I call self-governance. Um, you know, do you have the discipline to get up in the morning to one, make your bed, two, shit, shower, and shave, you know, take your diet, your supplements, uh, eat your breakfast, go to the gym and work out? Or are you the kind of guy, like, for example, sometimes I live alone um, when I'm here by myself, my wife's in Indonesia. I can get out of my bed, not make my fart sack, and I just leave it all, you know, leave it a mess. But I don't because, I, you know, it's called self-discipline. I will make my bed anyways. It's, it's the first, my first victory of the day. And every little victory, you know, it's, it's, I build onto that. Um, and then the third area I go into is the subconsciousness, where I talk about things like autogenic conditioning, okay, which is actually tuning your nervous system for performance, personal performance. And I also go into future pacing, creating your future in your mind's eye so that you can start developing that. And it, it, it all works to your subconsciousness. So when people ask me, Comstock, how did you do all these things in life? Uh, at first, I really didn't know the answer, but I figured it out and I kind of uh, basically organized it all in my head and go, okay, this is what I've done. For example, Indonesia. Um, here's a guy that's never been to Indonesia, Indonesia to 97% Muslim country. I always, back in 2007, saw myself living in a in a tropical paradise on an island, right? I saw it in my mind's eye, and I was happily married at the time too, right? And I had everything going. I had lots of money, and uh, but for some reason, I had this desire to live in a tropical paradise, and um, and so boom, I go to Indonesia. You know, circumstances led me there. And uh, ended up in Bali, in paradise. And, oh, yeah, in a 97% Muslim country where they don't like dogs, I actually started a canine company. And guess what? Most of my handlers were Muslims, right? So, And so I, I figured out the – I broke the code on how to build the business and, and basically how to almost impose my business will to create the lifestyle that I want, right? But I had already seen it in my head at one point. And uh, it started to manifest itself over time. So I show people how that works, how it can be done. And uh, you can, uh, you know, create the reality that you want in your head. So I turn the ideal into the real is what I do. That makes sense. No, that's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's super cool. And, you know, I like what you're talking about with future pacing and, you know, all this kind of things. I've, when I was uh, 14, I, ca- I read um, Tony Robbins, uh, Think and Go Rich and uh, Waking the Giant, and actually pulled a lot from those books with future pacing and goal setting and kind of tied that into my life as I was growing up and everything to 
uh, do that. So that's super awesome to uh, hear somebody else that's kind of in that state on that same mindset and yeah. wavelength and everything. At the, at the end of the day, if I had to tell anybody out there, you know, to answer your earlier question, what, you know, some takeaways, first of all, success is not based on willpower. Mm. Okay. It's not based on willpower and it's not based on philosophy. Philosophy is actually somebody's way of thinking, right? They might be wrong. So I don't buy into people's philosophy necessarily and willpower wanes. Okay, willpower will wane yeah. in time, right? So the only thing that keeps you going to your to your objective is the dream, the vision, right? You hear people use the term visualize, 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 but they don't actually tell you what that means. Visualization actually has an effect on your nervous system, okay, through a process called myelination, what I term as spinal tuning. Also, it not only does it uh, change the way you perform internally, but all so externally in the future. You just think of yourself as a walking, talking radio, electromagnetic frequency emitter and receiver. Okay, if you can do that and understand everything in this world is made is comprised of, of energy, now now you're part of this matrix, so to speak, and you can actually manipulate it to your favor. I know that's going to go over a lot of people's head, um, but the ones that are willing to stop and for a second and think about it, and embrace it, are going to be the one percent. Actually, say I say two percent. You said one percent. Um, actually, my in my trend thinking. Only 2% of the population has been successful and actually lives a life fulfilled, lives a dream because they actually, whether they know it or not, they had that mindset to create mm. the reality, right? The other 98% right. wander through the world aimlessly trying to figure it all out, you know, and they never have what I call purpose, which is that compass azimuth, that direction they want to go in life. And uh, they give up too easy. So anyways, I ramble, but uh, that's a little <laughs> no, bit. No, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, I know we got a couple minutes left. Um, What's uh, just kind of stepping back, um, military Delta, what were some of those, like, maybe like your two biggest takeaways from Delta that you've applied, whether it's in your life, whether it's in business that really moved you forward or moved the needle for you? Yeah. So, all right. So the unit, uh, <clears throat> let me just kind of explain a little bit about the selection process for the unit, the Delta force. Sure. You know, everybody talks SEALs, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the selection course for Delta Force, there's no other, it's the hardest one in the world, okay? And here's the reason why. First of all, there's only two two courses per year, selection courses per year. The, to get into the pipeline for the training uh, to be selected, it's a very arduous process. It starts with the unit does a, they canvass all the military records in in all the services and they look for the candidates that are, that meet the minimum requirements. Right. And there's a bunch of them, age, uh, non-judicial punishment, uh, rank, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, IQ, so forth. And then they go, okay, we've narrowed it out. And this many guys, we send them letters, say, congratulations. You, you qualified to apply to try out for Delta. Right. And so if you choose to do so, you go through the pre-qualification, which is more background checks, psychological evaluations, physical fitness tests, um, things like that. Should you pass all that, then you get another set of orders that says, okay, congratulations. Now you get to go to the selection course. The selection course on average is 100 candidates, okay? This is twice a year, all, all branches, all right? 100 guys got fine selected per course. Uh, in my course, we had 110. For some reason, we had 10 more. Um, but anyways, of the 110, six of us completed the course, and three of us were selected. At, wow. I was 23 years old, and at the time, I was the youngest guy ever to make it. The average age is 33. OK, I had four years in the military. That happens only twice a year. We've had some courses where nobody's made it. Some courses where one guy's made it. We call him the million dollar man. It's that difficult. You don't go through as a group, you know, running down the beach, carrying logs and singing songs and stuff. You go through the entire course by yourself. OK, you're not given you get very vague instructions. You're not harassed. You're not encouraged. OK, it's everybody's, basically everybody's very stoic and stone faced. You, you know, it's just. It's bizarre. You don't know what the standard is. You sure. don't know if you're meeting the standard. You're just told to do the best you can, whatever that is, right? And so what happens if you do the best you can, eventually you're going to burn yourself out because you can only go 110 miles an hour so long, so fast before the tank right. is empty. But it's the guy that keeps going even on the empty tank who pushes that car down the road that's going to it's going to make it. So very difficult course to get through. Now, once you get there, there's another six, seven months worth of training. It's also part of the selection process. Just because you're, we call it behind the fence doesn't mean you're in. Mm. In fact, the first day we showed up, I remember my instructor, our instructor, he, we all had our, our badges, our access badge. He goes, take a look at your badge. We all looked at it. He goes, you know what that badge means? He goes, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. He goes, it doesn't mean you're a Delta Force operator. He goes, all it means is you can walk through the front gate unharassed by the guards. That's it, right? And so, <laughs> damn. And, uh, so a lot of guys will wash out of that part of the course. And then if you're lucky, you make it to the end. There's another board and a selection board. 
and then you go to the squadron. And I remember when I arrived at my squadron, uh, my sergeant major sat me down day one. He goes, all right, he goes, so selection is a continuous process. He goes, if you don't give us 110% every, 10% every day, we don't need you. You're out of here. I was like, damn. And, um, but what I learned well, was this, and I remember it was Colonel Garrison at the time. He was a Delta Force commander, and he's in the movie Black Hawk Down. He came, he came to the squadron, and he said, he gave us a little, kind of like a little motivational speech. And he said, because, you know, the way you guys are selected, the whole process, he goes, there's absolutely nothing any of you cannot do, either collectively or unilaterally in this world. He goes, and he gave us some examples, right? And so that was always impressed upon us. And we all believe that there's nothing we can't do because we have this mindset. We have just to get to the organization you had to have a certain mindset. And so I've always, I've always had carried that mindset with me wherever I go in the world. And uh, I actually live by the old army model when I uh, recruiting model uh, model when I first uh, came in the military and it was be all that you can be. And so whenever I see an opportunity and I see something that inter- might be interesting, and I might like to try it. I always tell myself, be all that you can be, just be all that you can be, do it. You know, if you don't like it, so what? At least you tried it, but do be all that you can be. So I never bypass opportunities because I feel like maybe, you know, I'm not worthy or I don't have the experience. It's all bull- baloney, man. You can do anything you want in the world. If you want to do it, you can do it. So um, I had that confidence because of the organization, because what was always beaten into our heads, that we can do anything we want in this world. We, we you know, we had this mindset that, uh, and, it's, and it's true. Most of us have gotten out of the service and started our own companies, been very successful in, in the civilian culture because of just that mindset. We can do anything we want to do we, and, and believe it. No, that's awesome. I, I that's totally 100% agree. And I, I think that's, you know, super important. If you're not ever around that, or if you're not, um, have been through, uh, training or anything like that, you, you kind of miss out on that. And and like you said, you kind of get in that same routine every day, that, that zombie like that, and you're always going to be there unless you make that change to, you know, up here. Yeah. You always have to be prepared to meet the challenge. And I look at everything as a challenge, not as a problem in life. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, for example, I, I have a lot of clients that want to start a business, but they, it's problematic, right? Because, wow, you know, I don't want to, you know, I got to go get the license for this. I don't know if I know how to do that. You know, there's all these excuses at the end of the day. I'm like, you know, you're, you're you're making excuses. This is a problem for you. I said, look at it as a challenge. Embrace this, this, this hardship. Okay. Do the work. I said, you're going to fail a lot. That's okay. Because failing is learning. All right. And eventually, eventually you're going to cross the finish line. Okay. No God has ever been successful. Did it the first try. Look, Bill Gates, all these guys, right. They, they kept stabbing at the beast until they finally slayed it. You know, sometimes they have to stab it from a different angle, but they got it done. Um, nothing is easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And if everybody was, if it was that easy, everybody would be in the 1% club, right? There wouldn't actually be no 1% club. It'd be a hundred percent club, <laughs> right? right? So um, it'd be the other way around. <laughs> yeah. You want to be a one percenter. You've got to do the work, you know, nobody's going to give you anything. And we unfortunately live in a society where people feel like they're entitled to everything. Everything should be given to them, you know, the equal outcomes, you know, and nobody wants to do the hard work, man. And then they get mad because those that did the hard work are successful. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to acknowledge that, you know, maybe they actually did earn it. Right. So, you know, um, and maybe somebody didn't give it to them. And that's always been one of my biggest, you know, beasts with, you know, people in society is, you know, they're always complaining about, you know, the rich and these large corporations and CEOs ma- making all this money. It's like, well, look, I've run companies and I know how hard it is to run a company and I deserve my damn paycheck. Right. And when you come to me to work for me, you know, we have an agreement. I'll pay you this much money. You make widgets for this much. And that's our relationship, you know, and don't get mad at me because, you know, you made a lot of good widgets and I paid you a lot of good money and I'm getting rich and you're and you're feeding your family. You know, that's the arrangement that we have. But we live in a, a whole society has been turned around, man. So, uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know what? It's satisfying. Uh, I'm glad to wake up every day. I'm my own boss, have been for the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, I make my own shots, my, my own hours, call my own shots. And, uh, you know, and I take responsibility for my successes as well as my failures. And uh, that's the that's the most satisfying thing about being self-employed and being an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, instead of making other people rich, I'm making myself kind of rich i'm um, trying to anyway so you know uh, it's the challenge though that's important for me for sure awesome i hope you guys are taking notes 
listening to what Dale's been talking about. So many amazing insights dropped in there. Go back, watch, listen to this again, watch what we're talking about in this video, and then start applying you know, the different ideas or thoughts. Maybe something spurred that for you. And, th and then take action. That's the big key is taking action and, and doing something with it. If you want to find out more about his, uh, his story, his background, all the insights, check out his book, American Badass. And that's on like Amazon and where else can they yeah, find it? It's on Amazon. Um, you okay. can come to my website, dalecomstock.com or tier one performance coaching.com. And I can also, uh, you can buy a PDF copy, a copy of it for like five ninety nine. I can send it to you. So you can get an e-copy or you can buy the, the soft copy, uh, soft, uh, cool. actually, the hard copy too, by the way, hardback. Hard copy. Okay. Awesome. And then those are the, any, any, if they want more information on you and stuff, those are the websites to go to. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, Dale, I really appreciate you today. Awesome to really just pick your uh, understand what your background is and then how you've applied the different things that you've learned over your you know career and your life um, to really make a success out of what you're doing. Love the chair, <laughs> American flag of the chair. <laughs> awesome guys, check out Dale and again, Dale. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you. I am Josh Felbert. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary. <laughs>